Dear attendees, welcome to the second live session of the 8th Focus PIM workshop. In the first live session, Niels showed us how to optimize the microscope itself. Now we want to go a step further. That is right. Now we add an energy filter to the microscope and see what new features we gain. The energy filter behind the microscope will be a double hemispherical imaging analyzer. This combination is well known as nano -ESCA. And the additional features available with this will be demonstrated in a micro Arbus experiment by our colleague Timna. Exactly. So the nano -ESCA is very versatile and works well with any suitable light source. And we will use a focused HIS-14 VUV lamp in addition to the mercury lamp we used in the first live session. The higher photon energies uh, and flux of this source allow to examine the band structure in real time. Band structure mapping is very much associated with ARPAS. This technique is in use for quite some time now. What is the benefit of PIM or microscopy in this context? So in this live session, Tim and I will explore a silver polycrystal. It consists of various small crystallites, each with different orientations. With the nano microscope, he can navigate in real space on the sample surface to define a small area of interest. And then he can easily switch between the real space and the momentum space and collect electrons for a complete momentum space cube. Okay, and uh, that is what we call micro ARPES or momentum microscopy. Could you name some typical applications? It's definitely useful for all kinds of complex samples. For example, inhomogeneous uh, uh, surfaces, heterostructures, or for example, exfoliated uh, 2D materials, or even structured devices of uh, modern material systems. You will already find a lot of nice examples in current publications. That sounds absolutely exciting. Then let's jump right into the live session. So, hello. Um, welcome to the um, Nano Esca live session. Um, today, uh, I'm happy to present you <laughs> the Nano Esca. I will demonstrate um, one of its strongest capabilities. Um, micro Arpes. And first, I'd like to walk around to show you the, the setup. Um, then I give you a short uh, description of the software, very short, because you already had seen it for the PIM. And then we will jump into action and operate the Nano Esca. Um, okay, so here you can see the Nano Esca. Um, it consists of a PIM at the entrance. So it's hidden here, it's a little bit more compact than what you had seen um, with Niels, but um, actually um, identical. Um, then you see the two hemispheres, the idea, and uh, a second uh, part of projection optics uh, to project the image onto the imaging unit. And then with all is recorded with the SCMOS camera you already saw in the other live session. So today, the difference, of course, is our bandpass filter. And then we have two excitation sources running simultaneously. So on the right side, the, the mercury arc, so arc source um, for threshold emission, very high intensity for, the, for quick um, navigation in real space. And on the left side, uh, our focused helium lamp, the HIS-14. Um, it gives a spot of about 220 micrometers. So we have improved <coughs> um, regarding the, the pumping too. It has three pumping stages and you can see it in the pressure. We are at about six to the power of minus 10 while the, the helium lamp is running. So uh, it gives us quite a lot of time for surface science. Okay. So, um, here you can see our ProNano ESCA software. Um, it's the same software as used for the PIM, but of course now we have an energy filter included. So I will uh, show you 
where this is uh, displayed and, and controlled. Um, so the overview panel you already saw, we will today we will solely uh, work in the telescopic mode. Niels already explained actually to keep the intermediate image plane fixed. Um, then um, we will start with a low, a field, low magni magnification field of view. And uh, here in the second panel, you see the energy filter parameters. So we um, can choose the energy of our electrons here that are allowed to pass through our band filter. Um, it's uh, realized by a, by a bias potential at the sample. And then on the right side, you see the chosen analyzer resolution. And I will jump down to this panel here. So here you see the parameters of the bandpass filter that are leading to this energy resolution. So we're working with a path energy of 50 electron volts. This is the energy by which the electrons uh, are passing through the, the hemispheres and a slip width of one. Um, we can, for the non-ESCA, we can go down to 0 0.2 and we could go higher to two, two millimeters slip width. And the path energy highest is 100 electron volts, and the lowest 12.5. So um, I'm a little bit at the upper limit with the path energy and also with the slit. Um, why is this energy resolution, resolution chosen? Um, today, our aim is to um, look at the momentum space. So we like to have a good uh, case-based resolution. And of course, the um, energy resolution is directly um, related to this uh, case-based resolution. Um, furthermore, it's also related to the kinetic energy. But here, this is our basis. So for 200 milli electron volts, you can, at the, the high energies, we will work later, you can expect below 20 to the power of minus three reciprocal angstrom resolution, um, which is then really um, adequate to recognize uh, the bands. Okay, um, detector section, so we will work with the camera. We could switch to event counting. Actually, it's very helpful uh, for, for the case space, but today we will have um, uh, you already heard this, a polycrystalline silver sample, and the um, uh, intensity is very high we get from, from this sample. So um, it's a little bit too high for event counting. And on the other side, it's a bit easier to evaluate live data in analog mode. Maybe uh, the right moment also to mention that we have both sources, so the mercury source as well as the helium source, helium one line, up and running. So we have a lot of intensity in the low energy range, and then for the case space, a little less uh, intensity for the upper energies. Yes, and it's really a benefit. You will see it later when we do the fast switching between real and case space. There, it's really beneficial to have the two sources running at the same time. Okay, so let's start nano esca operation. I switch on the imaging unit. And you can see the live image of a 500 micrometer field of view of our polycrystalline sample, um, silver sample. And here you can already see several grains, but you also see um, that it's um, a little bit used up. So it's freshly prepared, but nonetheless, um, there are a lot of spikes on the surface. And if we zoom in a little bit. So I switch to 200 micrometer field of view. Um, you can see um, that even the surface is not perfectly flat. Actually, um, it's uh, very uh, bumpy. So there are valleys and, and mountains. I can uh, show you more clearly. So we, yeah, if we, um, move the contrast aperture to the left or to the right, we can enhance 
um, the, 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 the shadowing effect. And there you can clearly see that it's really a structured surface. So um, um, anyway, it's um, actually um, quite adequate, this sample, because um, we will see what we can get from such an imperfect surface. It will demonstrate what the nano SK is capable of. Um, so why have I chosen this region? Actually, you saw it before in the, in the lower magnification. Um, all around this region, there are much more spikes, much more um, defects and, and um, roughness on, this, on the surface. So here in this area, it's more flat. So that's why I will um, start the operation there. So in order to have the highest performance, we go to the high magnification mode. The complete instrument is designed for this mode, 12 uh, kilo electron volts. And here we are at the grain boundary. And um, uh, it's a little bit structured too, but we will, uh, we will start here. Okay, so how to operate and how to set the, the parameters correctly. So you already um, have heard about the, the analyzer resolution. Now I've chosen a field of view of 90 micrometer. And um, next step is to choose the size of the iris aperture. This is very important as... Um, so in order to define the area which you want to use for K-space imaging? Yes. Okay. So at the moment, if I would switch to K-space now, we uh, got the um, electrons from a large, um, from large uh, spatial coordinates, not only what we see here, but everything which is in the intermediate image plane here. And with the iris aperture, we really restrict the area where we collect the electrons. So um, I will close it. <coughs> something. Uh, so my aim is to close it to about one third of the field of view, or a little bit more. But I, I will close it later to this size. And now we can move the sample underneath and thereby choose our um, region we like to investigate in, in momentum space and close the iris aperture again. So actually, we are sitting right on, on this left side uh, crystallite pretty nicely in between the spikes and not too close to the grain boundary. So how to choose the iris aperture size? Uh, here, of course, um, smaller is always better because um, analog to, to real space, where a smaller contrast aperture gives you a higher uh, lateral resolution. For the K-space, this is a field aperture, the smaller you, you make it, the higher the K-space resolution. On the other side, you will lose transmission the smaller you make it, so you have to balance this. And then, of course, it depends on the structures on your sample. So I will, uh, sorry, I will move a little bit to the right, and you see the next grains we, I, I plan to investigate are a little bit wider than this size, so that's actually the reason. Um, so it's about 30 microns in diameter, this iris aperture. And um, the highest performance in K-space uh, you will get actually already with 30 micrometers. If you go lower, you will can improve a little bit, let's say 5%. But in between 30 and down to 10, it's um, the best performance. You could go even lower to a few micrometers. We will come to this later. OK, now I will close the ISO aperture. <clears throat> OK, to about 30 microns. You can always check the size 
as the image is calibrated. You can uh, measure any distances. So I will draw this box and choose the appropriate function here. And you can see from around 25, 65, so it's even a little bit larger. 40 and the other direction is a little bit smaller. So on average, we have 25 micrometers. And now I jump to K-space. So what is done, you already heard this in the, uh, the PEAM live session. Everything from the sample up to the intermediate image plane is kept, uh, <coughs> kept constant. And behind, the projection optics are, are changed so that now not the intermediate image is finally projected onto the image unit, but the back focal plane. And that, that's what we see here. Um, the back focal plane. So our momentum distribution is a little bit larger. So we can clearly see the rim of the contrast aperture. It's cutting off everything. So first, let's center it. And then one would have to check for astigmatism, the second stigmata, and for focusing with P1A. I did this already. OK, so actually, up to now, we have optimized our objective and the projectives um, with respect to the uh, specific parameter settings, so the deflectors and uh, some, some focusing will be changed. But we have not optimized for, for the sample. However, it's the best starting point you can have for the case space. Um, if you've optimized here the contrast aperture, you will only have to make very small adjusts, adjustments when looking at the real sample and when going to higher energies. OK, so let's open the contrast aperture. Now you see the event horizon. And as I, yeah, I, have, a, I have a question here. Yeah. How uh, do you make or how do you know that you are not restricted by the contrast aperture with respect to the angular range you look at, but that you really see the escape horizon? OK, you could. Yeah, you could calculate. <laughs> you could calculate your, your event horizon and then uh, choose the appropriate contrast aperture. Actually, that's why I have opened it now to, to the largest. But you could also move it. So if I have, um, if I would still have the small contrast aperture, um, you could move it around. Oh, sorry. OK, let's. Uh, and then um, you can see whether yeah, actually you can, can kind of scan. OK. Or, or if you ah, like okay. to make it okay. quickly, more quickly, of course, you just okay. open it and compare. So OK. Um, so um, as, as I already have mentioned, we have very rough the surface of our uh, sample. So that's the first result of this, a very blurry event horizon. Um, so we cannot expect the, the highest resolution for this sample. But we will see that the nano ESCA can um, get it good enough to really distinguish uh, between the, the crystallites. OK, so now I will start increasing the electron energy. Now I switch to 6 electron volts, um, which is um, provided by the helium source. So it's, of course, uh, much weaker. Uh, the center again. And then I can go up. We are still at the secondary electrons here. And here, perhaps at 12 electron volts, we can make a little bit readjustment. Yeah. OK. 
Okay. And then we can move up. Ah, sorry. <clears throat> and here we see the starting of the D bands of this silver crystalline. And you see, um, one can clearly recognize the structures. They are, again, a little bit blurry, but recognizable. And finally, we are entering the SP bands. SP bands. And, okay. And here I've reached almost the um, highest energy for helium one. And we see the Fermi surface. And I've moved the sample a little bit before, but I think we can still clearly see the Fermi surface for the first crystallite. So I'll take an image here. Um, 21 electron volts, the left plane. Okay, so here we have our first result, micro apples, um, from a, a micro spot of 35 micrometers. We got this image at, at the Fermi, close to the Fermi level, and I will save it. <coughs> so let's compare with the next Rain. Um, now I jump to, to the real space and all the parameters we have optimized before are recalled now. The only change is that we are using the, the large contrast aperture now. So it's, it will be a little bit brighter and a little bit less contrast. Now I will open the iris aperture. And we can move to the next grain. <clears throat> so we are a little bit off compared to the first first um, position. I accidentally hit the, the joystick, but it's still, you can see it here, it is still the, the same um, crystallite. So let's move a little bit down. Okay, and here we see the boundary again. And now I like to investigate the next grain. So I move to the right. Okay. To the center. And then close the iris patch again. Okay and jump back to K-space. And here also all optimized parameters are recalled. Uh, the energy too. So now we are jumping to the upper energy of helium one. And Fermi surface, yeah. And uh, you can clearly see it's there's a difference to the first image. So let's see it more clearly in 10 seconds. I name it the center grain. And here we can compare this with our, um, in the history window, we can recall all saved measurements of not only the image, but also the, um, all the parameters of the instrument and of the detector. Uh, it's a wrong date. Here we are, the left grain. So. So actually now, this is the, the first result of um, our micro Arpes, um experiment. So you can see it's very easy to quickly switch back and forth from K to real space, choose different features, and take a look at the, in this um, case, the film surface to distinguish the, the crystallites. So you see it's, um, not a new crystallographic orientation. It's just a, a rotation of the 110 cut. 
And actually, uh, on the crystal, this is uh, the dominant crystallographic phase, as it uh, has seen a lot of um, working hours. And um, actually, this different rotations are the main reason for the contrasts you have seen in real space. So rotation by round about 90 degree. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so another possibility to um, quickly assess the, the, the different crystallographic sites is to stay in the K space. So I um, just now I, I just move the sample underneath the iris aperture, but we keep, keep our live image here in K-space. And then at some point we should see a transition. Huh? Yeah, so here it goes very quickly. Here we go. And that was. Let's take an image. Let's, yeah, okay, let's take it here. You see there's a contribution from more than one yes. brain. So when we sit on the brain boundary with um, our K-space area we are looking at, then we should have both orientations present. OK. Yeah. So the, the um, contributions are not 50-50. Uh, and you see it's um, more to the bottom, the one side, whereas the other is uh, more, more strong over the complete field of view. Right boundary. And of course, you could continue this with, with your sample. Oh, sorry. And um, really make, make a map, a crystallographic map of your sample surface. OK. So we could now run a uh, full yes. stack. Yes, so two things I, I have in mind to show you in the remaining time. At first, I'd like to open the iris yeah, aperture. <clears throat> OK. So of course, this is not the full arpus. It's just one, one slice in the momentum space. And of course, the nano ESCA is capable of recording the full, we call it the, the K-space cube, consisting of all the slices for the available uh, kinetic energies. And then with such a cube, you can you have access to, um, to ARPIS spectra for different, for all, all available K vectors. So that's one thing yeah. we will do. Um, and before that, I like to um, just point out um, one thing about the iris aperture, how small you can make it, and what is the smallest yeah. size that makes sense. Um, so let's move back to um, our starting position. It was a pretty large brain. OK, this one. And then I move to actually, <laughs> actually to this one. So um, it's a pretty narrow brain. And now I like to close the Irish aperture by, by a factor of two more. Okay. That is really small. Oh. Yeah. Ah, sorry. So I have to. Okay, like this, yeah. Okay. So on average now we are at about 15 micrometers with the ice aperture size. Uh, I like to mark this area too. Ah. And then let's open. And now let's move to a grain boundary with a small iris aperture really to the grain boundary. So you see, 
I will now close the asset aperture. It's perfectly positioned on this center grain. But you see there, I marked in another area, a little bit larger, which um, has a contribution from the grain on the left side. So let's see what happens. <clears throat> Okay, so let's jump to Kelly space and again directly to the Fermi surface. Uh, we have a smaller iris aperture, less transmission, so we have to increase the uh, multi chain plate magnification. That's uh, really weak. Let's Alternatively, we could go to event counter. Yes, in this, yeah, here it would make sense. <laughs> okay, uh, so it's very weak. Uh, okay, it's very weak. So, um, actually, I have to. Uh, okay, it will work. I will save this image. <clears throat> close. <clears throat> so, we are very close to the Boundary, the iris aperture is 15. Um, and what you can see now in this image is um, the main contribution from, from the crystallite. I will recall the image from the larger conscious aperture. Center. So here it is. And what we also see, but it's quite weak. Actually, we, we already have had it here in this image. You see very weak contributions here on the side. And again, here on the right side. It's pretty weak. But um, actually, this uh, you will always have. The smaller you choose your contrast aperture, the stronger it will show up. This is because of the strong extraction field we are using. So you know we are collecting um, up to the acceptance angle is up is 90 degree. So I will show you one image here just to give you make it more clear. So uh, you can see here in green that's the 90 degrees. So let's say we have restricted our iris aperture to this region here which is um, marked by the red 30 degree trajectories. And you see there's always a contribution from an, a much larger area. And the calculation gives us this about 550 micrometers all around. And it originates uh, only from large angles. So that's why you can only see it in the outer part. Um, and that's that you have always to, to consider uh, whenever you place your, your micro spot aperture and whenever you make it very small. If there's a, a grain boundary or whatever boundary to the next structure, too close, you will have a small contribution. Okay, so um, then let's do the, the last thing. We record the full case space cube. Um, this can be done very easily and very quick if you just like to have a, uh, an overview. <clears throat> so I will choose a size of the iris aperture like in the beginning, but I will move just on one, yeah. just on one grain now. So we can do it like this. Uh, let's let's be sure about the grain boundary. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Switch to case space. And then we have to check the whole range of energies that are available. So it's a, a large dynamic range we have to cover up here. And um, 
I have to switch off the Merkel lamp for this. Otherwise, there would be way too much intensity at the uh, lowest energies. So let's. a bit low quality. Okay. So the the highest intensity is somewhere here. Okay. And let's see what we can accept. So we can really exploit the full range given by the camera. Okay, something like this. And then how to perform uh, such a measurement. We will send the current parameter set to our experimental section here. There we have access to, ah, let's make it darker. There we have access to all the parameters again. You can see it here. But now we just like to scan the energy. So we cover the, the full range given by our helium source. What, how much time do we have? We have five minutes. We have five minutes, okay. Yeah, we could um, do half the, the sort of 50 milli electron volts um, mm -hmm. uh, step size. Ah. Ah, okay, so we are running our energy scan from four electron volts to 22, which is a little bit above the, the helium one line. So actually, ah, for the documentation here, helium one line at 21.2 electron volts. And Iris aperture diameter is 35. Okay, and then I cho have chosen a step width of 50 milli electron volts. Oops. Okay. And at well time? Uh... At well time of only, so, oh, thank you, of only 500 milliseconds. So that's, um, ah, I have optimized for 300. So let's actually, I like to use 500. So let's check again. 1600. Okay. So we can go up to 1600. Yeah, something like this. Okay. So 1660. Okay, and then I will start the experiment. And now for each of the kinetic energies chosen, one image is taken, and in the edge end we will get a, a data stack, image stack. So here you can see the whole progress of your experiment. Also, if you have chosen different measurements, it would be shown there. I chose here spectrum. So now everything inside the screen circle is integrated and gives us one data point. Yeah, so to go back here, you could also define uh, more than one measurements. Let's say you, you have uh, autom if, you, for, if you have automatic uh, position readout, you could jump to uh, different positions on your uh, sample. You have chosen before beforehand and then do such a uh, case-based cube one after the other for each of the ch chosen positions. And of course, you could also improve the signal to noise by running several scans. And then everything here would be shown in, in this uh, different progress bars. So if you would like to just have certain um, regions measured of the K-space cube. Could mm -hmm. you, so let's say just around uh, 
Fermi H minus four, Fermi H minus two, and just very high resolution to um, intervals. Yes. Uh, would you set up then two measurements here, or can you define this within one uh, measurement? No, you would define several. Okay. So we can only run one axis. This would be the energy axis then, but you could, um, of course, so let's say one a little bit more to the field of view chosen. So I've chosen a field of view of around four reciprocal, uh, reciprocal angstroms because this is what we um, are filling out with 21 electron volts. So if you have a source of high energies, you would choose a larger field of uh, a lot of uh, larger feet of you. So let's say with helium two, you could go higher. However, of course, you could zoom in down to um, one reciprocal angstrom or even lower, and then move with the second stigmator to the feature you're interested in. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so and then do a more and select yes. within the case space. Uh, what you want to measure, really. Yeah. And then do, do a, a more adapted scan with the image um, uh, amplification adapted to this uh, structure. Because now, of course, uh, here the band structures are, in particular, the SP bands will be very weak in Signa. But this could always be the start to record the full case space view, mm -hmm. and then uh, search and select the uh, interesting um, regions. Okay, so here you see um, the full spectrum of this uh, silver crystallite. Uh, you see the, the D bands here, five the structures and the SP bands very low. And finally, <coughs> the Fermi edge at 21.2 electron volts. And then we are actually finished. So um, the time for this experiments have been three minutes. Yeah, so now it's done. And now I will show you how to make a quick analysis of this um, image stack. We, we use uh, um, free software image J. So here it is. The Nano Esca is shutting off the imaging unit after such an experiment. So you are safe that nothing uh, is happening there with the imaging unit. And now I can <coughs> load in the data here. Awesome. Okay. Totally wrong. The data. So today, 17th, and the, yeah, this is the data cube. Scan, select. So in here, you can, again, <coughs> see the uh, data we recorded with before. So the whole cube. Here we see the, um, the D-band structure rising up. And now you can do different uh, kinds of analysis. First, let's uh, choose a region and look at the spectrum. That's what you have seen before. But of course, now you could also go to one of the structures and just look at the spectrum there. So everything is um, accessible, it's, yeah. it's accessible in this data stack. And on the other hand, so I will scale a little bit this data. And then we can have a look at the cuts through this data stack. And on the right, you see the KY vector cut where this the energy. And here at the bottom, oh, it's a little bit Ah, okay. Uh, I have to enlarge it. Okay, here. And here you see the Kx cut versus the kinetic energy. So let's stick to this one. 
you can now investigate every slice. So all the kx, ky, the complete momentum space is available um, with, um, um, with the energy cut. So you have all the ARP spectra that are available here for this, um, yeah. this slide. And if you would just be interested in that part, then you could, for the measure measurement, just select this part with higher energy resolution in the analyzer, with smaller step size, and so on. Yes, right. yes, yeah. yeah actually, in, in our uh, software, you could also, um, the, the, the quick switch between real and case space, you have not um, to stick to the, um, to the filtering parameters. Yeah. You could do, you could use rough analyzer resolution in real space, just just to have a um, to, to be able to quickly navigate, and then you jump to case space and use much more demanding uh, um, parameters, with, with, which gives you higher energy resolution. Yes, ah. that, that's possible. Well, so there is room to to optimize the measurement procedure according to what you really need. You don't always have to st take a full data cube. 3D data cube. Yeah. yeah, so then actually we are finished. I hope you, um, I could uh, keep your attention and I hope you can take along some um, useful skills about the, the critical parameters here for, for this kind of experiment. Yeah, and now we yes. are open to uh, questions. If I reduce the field of view in real space, but don't close iris aperture enough, such that iris aperture is larger than the field of view. Will the case space represent the yeah. photoelectrons from the field of view or iris aperture? Or is it practical to simply have the field of view larger than iris aperture every time? Yeah, so the answer to the la last question is yes. <laughs> it's more practical. And so actually the first one is answer two. It's always, always the iris aperture. That's not the full truth. <laughs> There's also the entrance state. So if you have a very large, if you choose a very large iris aperture, it could be that not the iris aperture, but that the entrance state of, of your idea is limiting the, the, the region. So I just show you one parameter, which I haven't mentioned now. So whenever you set the iris aperture, whenever you fill out, the virtual slit size is calculated. And let's say we make it larger. You see, it's getting larger. It also depends, of course, on, on, on the on other parameters of your objective lens. And um, but this you you can compare. So here we are still. So let's say if we, we close it to 50, or let's actually 50 is a nice value. The virtual slit size is almost in the same <coughs> range as the um, as the iris aperture. So now we are the, the the complete image we have chosen with this iris aperture will be passed through. If we make the iris aperture larger, it will be cut off by the slit. So there you always can uh, check this value. Okay. Um, so from, from Harkon comes the question, would it be possible to do some form of dark field momentum microscopy from what you show here? Uh, a correlate features <clears throat> at certain locations in K-space to specific locations in real space. If so, this could really be useful when working with spatially restricted samples. Uh, for example, exfoliated flakes of polyprocine samples like the silver we have mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's absolutely possible for this. Um, you would change the contrast aperture while operating in case space. So let's say, so let's recall one image here. Let's say you have such a case space, or even here's more structure. Let's say here, this is your um, your case space image with a lot of features. And now you would close the contrast aperture and move it to the smaller one. So we have a smaller contrast aperture. We have one with 500 
or 850, 500, and 150. So depending on the size of your structure, you like to um, have the, 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 the real space correspondence, you will um, move the contest aperture. So and you, then, you, you had yeah. seen the, the small... And then you would uh, yeah. choose a prominent feature in K-space which is only uh, representing one uh, domain right now, yeah, or one crystallite orientation, and then this area should look brighter than the others. Huh? Yeah. yeah you, the, the, yeah. You, you had seen the small um, 150 microns contest aperture, then you could restrict to this small feature, for example, and switch to case space and check where this comes from. Okay. Actually, there's a group, there's a publication. Nick Barrett did it. That's yeah. Nick Barrett, yeah. who, who did such um, experiments. OK. The chat. Um. Ah, OK, it's the same with the ISA patcher. Mm. OK, yeah, not the yeah. same. I think Martin re yeah. readdressed the questions to me. Yeah. Well, okay. um, so Timna, thanks uh, in the name of the audience. Yeah, <laughs> uh, thank, thank you for, you for your patience. <laughs>